morning. And uh, I plan on this afternoon being 15 minutes. So we used 15 minutes. So you are dismissed. <laughs> Just kidding. We have some plans moving ahead. We have some plans doing stuff, and it's going to be good. But what I want to just look at is a few thoughts today, and I know I can't do this in 15 minutes. I'd love to, but Jesus says something in Luke chapter 8, verse number 30. We'll pick it right up from this this morning. If you didn't see this morning's sermon and you're watching right now online, go to YouTube, catch out this morning's sermon, catch up on it, and then pick it up from here. When Jesus says, and Jesus asked him saying, now this is a conversation. The Son of God, God himself is asking a horde of d demons or devils their name. I mean, what is your name? And he, I mean, just stand there and see this conversation. Why ask a name? Now, I mentioned it this morning and briefly passing. I've mentioned it before. It's a common belief that a demon cannot be exercised or cast out without knowing the demon's name, the devil's name. This has been lore for years and years and years and years and years. Uh, how true is it? It seems to be substantiated by our scriptures. When the devil, God here talks about his name. Um, uh, what is thy name? What happens is something pr uh, pretty neat. And I know we haven't gotten to Luke chapter 9 yet. Um, but, uh, but I want you to get an idea of, of what, what happens in the background of Scripture? Something you want to look in because things happen in our Bible that don't make any sense sometimes. Now, when something doesn't make sense, it's something awesome. Okay? You ever heard of golden nuggets, right, in your Scripture? It's a golden nugget. Well, a golden nugget is when you look at it it's saying, that don't make any sense. Jesus is not... Why would Jesus say that? It doesn't make any sense that Jesus would look at a father who brings his son to Christ and says, please help my son. And he says, oh, faithless generation, how long must I put up with you? Does that sound like Jesus? It doesn't sound like our compassionate Lord, but that's what he says. Why does Jesus say that? It's, it's, uh, the, there's more to it than just, you know, is the, the, the light reading. Something is happening here that brings this expurlative, this brings this word out of Christ's mouth. Oh, faithless generation, how long must I suffer thee? Now, to me, if I was the dad, I'd be like, oh, <laughs> I, don't know. I, mean, I mean, he doesn't do that to the sour Phoenician woman begging for the life of her child. Uh, why does they do this? And Oh, by the way, we do find out uh, in that story that children can be demon-possessed, and how many of you know that already? <laughs> right. And uh, Luke, Luke chapter 9, something amazing happens here. Something amazing. Now, to understand Luke chapter 9 is a big, big, big brain thing. I mean, you, how many of you have a big brain? I mean, you've got a brain that can understand a lot. How many got a big brain, but there's very little it to, in it? You know, it's mostly hollow space. Hello, hello, echoes around. And uh, you're talking about the Mount of Transfiguration, okay? This is, we could study the Mount of Transfiguration for a long time. When I say Mount of Transfiguration, if you say, yes, I know what you're talking about, go, yes, I know what you're talking about. Okay, Jesus takes three of his disciples, the inner circle. Why only those three? Why not all of them? Okay, if you got that answer, what day did he take them? Okay, all right, that's, that's the eighth day. And he takes them up, and they go up into a mountain. Why a mountain? What was the name of that mountain? Do you know what mountain it was? Why is it on top of a mountain? The mountain gets overshadowed by a cloud, right? Jesus gets transformed before him. They fall down on their face into a deep, deep sleep. They're res No, they're not resurrected. They woke up. They're resurrected out of that sleep, and behold Christ in all of his glory, standing, raised up, and hunt. no, he's not flying. He's standing next to them, right? It's only in the movies he's flying. But uh, And who's standing next to him? But Moses and Elijah, and they start to discuss things concerning the kingdom of heaven. Oh, Moses in the promised land? What's he doing there? And then you have Elijah standing there. Why those two? Are those the two witnesses? Who's at Jesus' right and left hand? And uh, standing there is before them, and of course Peter, being the spokesman for us, what's he do? Uh, let's build three tabernacles. So Peter puts his foot in his mouth, says, let's build three tabernacles, right? And puts, why can't you build three tabernacles? One for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Christ. 
that makes them equal. Right, Joe? What are you going to say? Yeah, he, he, he puts them on equal level, right? And you can't put those on equal level, right? You can't do that. And, and, uh, and God is gracious, does not strike Peter dead. And then, then Jesus Christ suddenly, what happens? The cloud overshadows them all, and who speaks? God the Father speaks. What is this? A triune moment, right? You got the Holy Spirit indwelt the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ shining in his glory and God the Father speaking. When you see a triune moment in your Bible, you better stop and say, whoa, hold the horses. Something big is happening here. It's a triune moment. How many triune moments do we have in our scriptures? We know the baptism is one. Here's another one. Is there another one? Yeah, John chapter 12. Oh my goodness, what happens in John chapter 12? You just pick three defining moments in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And his, his ministry is divided by those three moments. You might want to check out those three moments, right? John chapter 12, right? What's that? The rejection of the nation, right? And uh, John chapter 12, Jesus went and hid himself, and they saw him no more. He says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of God. Wow. So anyway, don't, don't get me into this. Um, so now we're in, we're in the mountain transfiguration. Jesus comes down off the mountain, and somebody's calling me. It's Chris Solanus. Should I answer it? <laughs> I'm just going to text him and say, you should be watching church right now, brother. And... Uh, <laughs> Poor Chris, he was exhausted. <laughs> Get the birthday party going for his wife. He did hide it from her. That's not easy. She's a detective. Uh, Mount, they come down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and he comes down from the mountain, and down are the rest of his disciples, and they are surrounded by a crowd. There's, a, there's these certain select Jews left behind that are surrounded by a crowd, and Jesus is coming down from a mountain transfigured in his glory. Maybe you got the picture yet? Where are we at? We are at the Armageddon. We are at the Battle of Armageddon. And uh, so this is a, a miniature picture of the Battle of Armageddon. So they're coming on down. Uh, Jesus is coming to fight the Battle of Armageddon. And what do they discover when they get there? They discover this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. What is the kind that cannot go out? And what is this kind? And what is he talking about? And um, in verse number 37... It says, And it came to pass that the next day when they were come down from the hill, much people met him. And behold, a man, uh, this is 9.37, right? I gave you that? Okay. And behold, a man of the company cried out, cried out, Hey, Jesus, a man of the company, saying, Master, I beseech thee. Master, what does that tell you? Who calls Jesus Master? How come he didn't say Lord? What didn't he call Christ? Who else calls him Master? Uh, so you want to get an idea who this is. Uh, Look thou on my son, for he is my only child. And lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out. And it teareth him that he foameth again, <laughs> and bruiseth himself, hardly departed from him. And bruising him, hardly departeth from him. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. Hmm, how interesting. Look at Matthew chapter 17. This, this is a, Jesus is facing a legion before then, and uh, uh, and then look at Matthew chapter 17, I've got to turn back a page, uh, now nah, that works, Matthew 17, 14, and when they were come to the multitudes, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him, Matthew 17, 14 saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. Huh, there he calls him Lord. Indication. Why is it changed and what happens here? He is a lunatic. Now, I pray that often. It's my life verse for a while. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's a lunatic. And sore vexed, and oftentimes falleth into the fire. We get some other things. And often to the water. Why does he mention fire and water? Why these two elements? And what happens here? It's interesting. And uh, you'll see a lot about elementals, by the way, in their Bible, and how God controls the elements. And it's a real battle against those naturalists who worship the elements. Um, and I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. It says over there, I brought him, and they could not help. They could not cast this devil out. Now, the disciples have been able to, right? They, they, they'd expect them to. Did the disciples think they could? Why did they think they could? Well, Jesus had given some of them power before. Did he do it at this time? Was there a belief they could cast him out? He brought him. Why did he bring him to the disciples? Well, Jesus is gone right then. 
And they couldn't overcome this devil. They could not beat him. Jesus' response then in verse 17 uh, says, Then Jesus answered, O faithless and perverse generation, how long will I, shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Does it sound like our Lord? Boy, that's a pretty harsh reaction. Lord, can you help my son? I brought him to them. They couldn't help him. Lord, can you? Oh, perverse generation. Oh, faithless generation. How long will I be with you? Wow. Well, that answer tells you something's happening here, isn't it? Something's happening here. What's going on here? Why does Jesus say this? Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from the very hour. Now comes a good question. Then came his disciples, and they asked him. They asked, then came his disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? Lord, how come we couldn't do this? And Jesus saith unto them, Because your unbelief, verily I say unto you, if you had faith as the grain of a mustard seed, and you say unto this mountain, Be removed thence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be possible to you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So he says, There's a problem with your faith. How much does faith does it take to get saved? Mustard seed faith. That's where we get that for here. If you had faith of a mustard seed. Just a tiny, tiny amount of faith for salvation. Now, in the history of Christianity, has anybody, to your knowledge, ever moved a mountain? Has anybody ever said to a hill, to a, to a land mass, be gone? And it was gone. So this has never happened. Did Jesus ever do it? When? When did Jesus move a mountain? He walked up to a mountain and said, you know, I don't want to walk up this hill. He could, which would be cool, right? I don't want to walk up this hill. <laughs> right? How many hunters thought that, right? Would be, you know, <laughs> if you could move a mountain, how many hunters would have moved that hill, right? <laughs> said, we'll make the, you know, I want this downhill. <laughs> right? you know, when you're low on gas, right? You could change the topography. And, could your faith do that? Has anybody's faith done that? So what is Jesus talking about? Mountains in your life. When you come to a problem that you just can't solve, just pray and it'll go away. Now give me your wallet. Um, what, what is the Lord talking about here? There's no record at all of mountain moving, of, of faith has been the problem as far as, is, is my lack of faith? Is that what he's saying? He said, oh, faithless generation. But he says here, if any faith at all could do this. Well, do they not have faith? Is, is, are the disciples unsaved? Do they have mustard side seed faith yet? Then why can't they do it? Is, is Jesus' fix that he mentions here, is it fitting in your mind? Have you figured out where their faith was lacking, where they had no faith? And because of that, what was it? We're not talking salvation here. Obviously, these are saved people. What are we talking about? Tremendous T uh, tremendous portion of the Bible. What is he talking about? Uh, and Jesus walks up and removes this. Why does Jesus come out and say this? Let's go to Matthew and Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 40, it says, And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. And Jesus said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. And as he, as he went, as he was yet coming, the devil threw him down. A little more information. We didn't know this. The devil throws him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit. There we have devil and unclean spirit in one phrase, or one verse. And healeth the child. Notice it's called a healing when the devil's cast out. Isn't that interesting? What kind of healing is it? And delivered him again to his father. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered, everyone at all at all things which Jesus did, at they wondered everyone at all things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, Let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the hands of men. And they understood not this saying. So he goes right into what he's going to suffer. 
and starts talking about what he's going to suffer. Weird. Oh, let's go to Mark. Does Mark say anything more about this? It's in Mark chapter 9, I think. And uh, Mark chapter 9 and verse 14. So when he was come to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them. Disciples surrounded and can't cast out a devil. And Jesus descending off the mount with certain Jews that went with him while others were left behind. <laughs> and the scribes questioning them. So here's the scribes now. What, what's the matter? Can't, why can't you do this? The scribes of the law are questioning the disciples about the fact that the disciples cannot help this child. Interesting. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to, to, to him saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? Hmm. So what's going on here? Jesus walks up, sees it, he says, and now Jesus comes up to his disciples, steps before them, faces the scribes, and says, what you talking about? Now Jesus, of course, speaks much better. And one of the, the, one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. He cannot speak. What's the problem? Who knows his name? Jesus. Who doesn't know his name? Anybody else. And where so where so he take them, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. Notice here, you see part of this is uh, uh, anorexia is involved here. He pineth away, he won't eat. Interesting, isn't it? And I spake unto thy disciples, if, if you want to count the demonic oppressions in Jesus and start counting how many mental illnesses are involved with them, you might be surprised. And I spake unto thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not, which means they tried. How did they try? And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto brought. They brought him unto him, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and he fell down on the ground and wallowed foaming. Wouldn't that be a sight to see? What would it be like to see a child going through that? And he, and he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? Now, why does Jesus ask that? Does he know the answer? Why does Jesus ask questions? I hear all kind of mumbling. It's so cool. Tell each other, you know, why does Jesus ask a question? For our benefit? The readers 2,000 years later? But yeah, yeah, you think it's for our benefit? I'd say that's why it's recorded. For those around him too, right? What about for the Father? What do you think? So they don't lie. Oh, yeah, that's some insight there, Right. He records it for us. He records it. And, he, and why does God say to the leper, no, he says to the blind man, uh, what, basically he says, what do you want? What would you like me to do? Would you say that to a blind man? You're, you're, you're God of the flesh, hard to picture, and uh, you can heal anybody. And a blind man comes up to you. Would you ask him what he wants? And he said, Lord, that I might see. Why did God do that? What do you think, brother? I <laughs> think there's something to let our request be made known unto God. Ask? Hmm. What if we don't ask? So there's some teaching going on here. What's that, sister? What? I, I didn't hear you. I start talking, and my mouth's too big. You ask not? He asks, he says, well, why are your prayers not answered? He says, well, you ask not, because you have not, because you ask not, right? Plain as day, right? That's, it's, some of that skips. So he asks his father, how long ago since this was on him? Why does, why does Jesus want to bring forth the information of the time frame of this possession? Hmm. And he asks his father. Now, don't, now, I know some of you are going to go home and try to get the demons out of your kids, but listen to this. Now, <laughs> Lord, he's a lunatic. <laughs> and God's going to say, how long has he been like this? Since he was born. 
<laughs> How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. Now, this is a child, right? This is a young child, so this, he must mean as a younger child. I mean, this thing, how, can a ch how old do you have to be to be possessed of the devil? <laughs> it's, this, I just look at this and I think, it, I mean, that, uh, some people, you know, have advantages when they're born, and other people are little disadvantages in their position. This is a disadvantage. I mean, you're what, a year and a half when you're possessed by a devil? What was that? Well, it's a, we could argue that, right? All children have devils until they're about 12, or is that when the devil comes in? You know, does it ever leave? What? And this clearly, this devil is is for the child hasn't been allowed to talk, talk. He's dumb. He also throws himself in fire and water. You always as a parent watching because he's trying to kill himself. You you walk by the. I mean, we know kids. You know, well, what? Uh, well, yeah, you got four boys. I'm looking at what do the boys do when they see a mud puddle? You know, I mean that you've got a splash in it, right? You just you have to. I open up the doors in the school bus. There's a mud puddle there, and it just happened with two weeks ago. The kid gets out, and, and he's he's a you know he's a troubled child. He's, he doesn't function quite right, but he's all boy. He steps out and he turns away from mom. Let's she let's go. She goes, "What are you doing?" He's psh, 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 you know, standing in the mud splatter, water splashing. Like, oh, don't do that. And I'm like, oh, he's, he's still all boy. And uh, is that what the boy did? No, he tried to throw himself in the water. He tried to throw himself in the fire. Why would he do that? What was that? But was the boy trying to kill himself, or was the demon trying to kill him? Or is, or is the boy just so just wrought to the fact that he, he gets to be suicidal? Suicide part of demonic oppression? But if I'm a parasite, did you just, huh, huh? That was my wife. <laughs> why does the coronavirus mutate? Why is it mutating the way it is? Why do viruses mutate? What's wrong with the coronavirus in the beginning? Why would it mutate to want to change? Because it was too deadly. No virus wants to kill its host. It wants to use its host to spread its disease. But when it's too deadly, it kills its host. What happens if it killed everybody who had it? <laughs> you, you, you can't go nowhere, right? Your goal is to cause your host to, to multiply you. It uses your cells to multiply its virus, and then you cough it out, and off it goes. It's, it's to replicate itself. So, the, so generally, the mutations will eventually get less and less deadly because it doesn't want to kill us. Now, there's always a chance it might mutate into a way. Yeah, I don't know if you're watching the next one, but um, so check out CoV. It's covert, co with a capital V, and it's mixed with Mars. Which is which is far more deadly than COVID. It's a type of COVID disease, and it's it's one mutation away from jumping to human. One mutation. They're watching it right now. The Wuhan lab just discovered it. I'm serious. It's coming out about two months ago. They discovered it, and it's this close to becoming. It kills one in three. It's the next coronavirus. It's right on the edge. It's right on the edge. It's right on the edge. Man, good thing for the Wuhan virus or the Wuhan lab or we'd all be in trouble. Um, that's scary stuff. That Mars comes out. That SARS or Mars. I don't know if you've studied those. Study SARS and Mars, the COVID SARS and Mars, the original ones that came out 50 years ago. They are deadly. I mean, they make this COVID thing look like a picnic. The only thing is it can't spread human to human good at all. But if it mutates with the ability to spread like the Onicron, but yet can kill like the MERS, it's actually MERS. I think it's M-A-R-S. Um, Mars and SARS, or Mar Mars and SARS, and uh, it just, MERS, MERS and SARS, 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 and it just kills, bro. That, that thing just, it wipes you out. And uh, can you imagine losing a third of America? How do you bury? If we're 330 million, there'd be 110 million people dead. How would you bury 110 million people? In two? You can't. They'd be laying all over the streets. You'd have mass graves. You'd have to be pushing them into bulldozers. Could you imagine? You imagine, you think the world's in panic now. Anyway, we're at this point here, oh, faithless generation. What is going on here that brings this, this out of the Christ's mouth? What has happened, and why is it we? Why do we find it in Luke chapter 9, right after Luke chapter 8? See what you pay me for? That kind of brilliance? 
Mark chapter 9 is right after Mark chapter 8. But we've got a similar situation that takes place in Matthew, or I'm sorry, yeah, Matthew chapter 12. Now, as soon as I say Matthew chapter 12, our Wednesday night crowd who went through the series says what? It's the end of the offering. Excuse me, I just burped. You heard that, Angela? So are you laughing at me? Uh, the end of the offering of the kingdom of heaven, the withdrawal of the kingdom of heaven, and the, now the mystery kingdom takes in in Matthew chapter 13. He switches all the parables. There's a dispensational change in chapter 12 to chapter 13 of Matthew. You rightly divide your word. And now, so what happens? What takes place in Matthew 12? It's called the unpardonable sin that takes place. What is the unpardonable sin? Rejecting the Holy Spirit, God's people rejecting him. They're claiming that he, he, he cast out a devil by the power of devil. Anybody else? What's the unpardonable sin? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is how it's defined. All right. Yes. Seeing Jesus in person, right? Now, how many of you have seen Jesus in person? Nobody, right? We don't, right? But it has a little bit more than that, but yes, yeah, seeing Jesus in person, but it's also hearing the voice of God and then rejecting it flat out. Now, part of what's, if you, I was just, me and Joe were just discovering this, part of what's, we, we live in what, the age of grace. We don't hear the voice of God. And as because we don't hear the voice of God, we, we, we're, we're given an extended period of time to respond. We're allowed a lot more time to respond as the Holy Spirit works on us. If God shows up like he does in Mount Sinai, if God shows up and speaks directly to a person, what happens when that person doesn't accept it or disobeys it? A lot more accountability. I mean judgment today. And I mean, like, it falls, like, fast in their life. I mean, uh, you might think you're Jonah, but you haven't been through what Jonah did. You, you, when they heard the audible voice of God and then rejected it, trouble came now and fast. But when we don't hear the audible voice of God, and you never have, we have the Word of God before us, and we read it, and the Holy Spirit working on us in this age of grace, the Holy Spirit allows that time frame to come. What happens when God speaks next time? Read Hebrews chapter 12. What happens next time God speaks? They heard the voice of God then. They'll hear God's voice again. And he'll shake heaven and earth. And what's going to happen? Right? When God speaks next time, they're in trouble. What happened is God was standing before them. God performed what only God could do. And they looked at that and said, I know what that is. I know only God could do it, but I'm going to refuse that. I'm going to call you the devil. And you're doing that by the power of the devil. So, uh, knowing and seeing and hearing and rejecting. Well, what was it Jesus did? He cast out a devil. Out of what? A mute. Why does Jesus keep casting out devils out of mutes? And when he does, they refuse to believe it. And it brings out this from Christ, O oh, faithless generation. Well, what is their faith? If you just had this much faith in what? They're obviously saved. He brought his son to Jesus. What was it that Jesus was doing that they brought another deaf mute to him, or mute, deaf, dumb, couldn't speak, demon-possessed? Why couldn't his disciples cast it out? There's your riddle for today. And as you start putting this together, you're going to start to understand Jesus' ministry a little better. What Jesus was performing, only God could do. Why? What is your name? Our name is Legion. This is the directly defiant to God. They're not answering him. They're not telling him his, their name. They're, they're giving them, you know, because we're many of us. We can't tell you. There's too many of us to tell your name. Just call us Legion. We're Legion. Go ahead, call us Legion. Is that their name? No, it's not their name. What do we have to do with thee, O Son of God? We adjure thee by God. Don't cast us out before the time. What are you doing here? It's not time yet. What's your name? Pfft. Legion. What are you going to do with that, huh? What's Jesus' next words? 
recorded in the Bible. The next word he uses is go, <laughs> which is kind of cool, right? It's only found in Matthew. But it's the, the Mark, Mark and Luke will come out and say, and they ask him, they adjured him, they begged him, send us into the swine. Why? Where didn't they want to go? What were they so afraid of? Where's the desert places? And where do they go where there's no rest? Why are they so afraid to go somewhere where there's no rest? Where was Christ going to send them? Have you come to torture us before the time? Don't send us out. Get out of him. Why? What do we have to do with you, son of God? Son of the Most High is what they say. We adjure thee by God. Uh, cast us not out. Torment us, tor torment us not. Have you come to torment us before the time? Cast us into a swine instead. What are they going to get out of that? Why do they want to be inside of a living creature? What is the rest and what is the desert place? Where is it they're afraid to go? Well, to understand some of this, to grasp some of this, is to understand that uh, the demon-possessed man is Israel. Israel's completely demon possessed and gets in typology. Now we're going to typology. Get the typology, start to understand the story. The demon possessed man is the type of Israel, completely de de demon possessed and rejecter of Israel, a uh, rejecter of Christ. Christ comes in. Christ warns about the cleaning of the house and cleaning it up. What did Christ come to do? Why casting out so many devils? Why cleaning the temple? Why straightening out the religion? Why bring it up? What is Christ coming to do to the house? And what's the warning that's going to happen to the house? And whose house is it? And it's the house of God, Israel. Israel, house of God, clean and swept by Jesus Christ. And then what comes back into it is seven more wicked than itself. What, where is Israel going to go if they reject their Messiah? And so the, the pictures here, what happens is Jesus talks in Matt, uh, Luke chapter 11, and then this, this, this kid here, who's, or this, this legion here who's possessed, is a, a picture of Israel who is possessed. You start to, okay, start to see those pictures of what Christ is coming to do. But we also see the fact that uh, the Messiah comes to, to, to um, as God, knowing the names of every devil, can cast the devil out when the devil's dumb or mute and can't speak. And therefore, when the devil can't speak, the trouble of casting out a devil. Now, why is there faith that enters in here? Faith in what that would allow me to cast out a devil from a mute? And that's the key. It has to do something with what Israel rejected in Christ is something that the disciples are battling, rejecting in Christ. As a result of the disciples rejecting this about Christ, they couldn't cast out the deaf mute. As a fact of Israel not accepting the same thing about Christ, they can't purge themselves of this, of this wicked devil. And then more comes in as Christ sweeps the house. What, what are we seeing here? I know this is, this is picturesque, and I'm not answering a lot of questions today. I'm just kind of putting the pictures out there for you. As your brain starts to see, there's a lot happening here in our Bible. And we're, we're talking about the confrontation of two spiritual beings. One's eternal God, the other one's thousands of years old, and there's a horde of them. And there's a confrontation and then a conversation between them. And what happens? Uh, Luke chapter 11, 8, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 8, let's just finish it and just, just for fun, we'll read the rest of it and we'll be done. Um, uh, in Luke chapter 8, and let's look at verse 30. And Jesus asked him, saying, interesting statement, he asked the man there. He's talking to the devils, talking to the man. It's very, very complex as you look at the other synoptics. What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him, they begged Jesus, that he would not command them to go out into the deep. There's something they're afraid of. There's a great fear in the demon horde, a great fear that they would beg him. Matter of fact, in, in, uh, I can't remember which one it is, Mark or Luke, Matthew, where he says, we adjure thee by God. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on a, on a mountain, pigs on a mountain. Is there a picture here? Pigs on a mountain. Why is this a Gentile man filled with devils? And a bunch of pigs on a mountain. What, what, what do I see here? 
and they saw him that he would suffer them to enter into them. Would you allow us, please, we, we jure thee, we beg you by God, let us go into these pigs. Do not send us to the abyss. Do not send us to the deep. Do not do that now. There's a great fear in their hearts over this. Please send us into the swine. Let us go. Could they not go themselves? Why, why not just leave? And why not just say, oh, this is too much for me. I'm out of here. Why do they ask, have to ask Jesus Christ if he would allow them to go into the swine? Why not just, <laughs> I'm out of here. Right? Hmm. There's, there, there's hundreds of questions, right? Not hundreds. Okay, a few questions can come out of our minds here. In verse 33, and when the devils, when the devils, uh, and, and then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, right? Now, what in the world happens next? And why does it happen? And why does a pig, a swine, when it's possessed by a devil, commit suicide by drowning. And the herd ran violently down a steep place. Why did it mention the manner in which they rode? It's, it's, it's violence. Why does it have to be steep? Why does it have to go into a lake? And why do they all die in the water? And how many of you want to sing Bubba's Barbecue? Right? I mean... Uh, Brother Bear Brady, how he comes up with a song about Bubba's Barbie. I don't know how he does it. That's just tremendous. So what's a bunch of dead pigs floating in the water mean to you? What's, what's it mean? What, what's, what's, so you're standing there, you're a disciple, you see this whole thing take place. The guy, it doesn't tell us what happens immediately after this man, but it seems as though instantly he's in his right mind, he's fine. Where'd they get the clothes? John, I think he's about your size. Uh -huh. right. who, who brought the extra clothes for the guy? Right? They dress the guy. He's now in his normal clothes, and he's sitting there. He's, is he exhausted? Is he tired? What's he like? What's he, what's he wearing? He's, he's listening to Christ. What's his personality like? I think they're getting to know him and say, hey, so yeah, what's it been like for the last four years? Man? I mean, how long? Do you, do you remember? Do you have a wife, kids? What, yeah. what are they learning about this guy? They're all sitting there talking to him. And, and meanwhile... There's their boat, and over there, there's a little bit of a cliff over there, and there's a 2,000 dead pigs floating in the water. You think maybe a little bit later, you know, John and Andrew walked over, and they're standing there looking at all these pigs? Where the devils go when the pigs die? Where'd they go? 2,000 birds? <laughs> <laughs> picture. <laughs> uh, what? What is it? What? What is it? Who, who? Anybody got another idea? What's? Well, what do you see when you see two thousand? When you see two thousand pigs dead on the dead in the water? What do you see, Joe? I know it's just an idea. What do you see? Could be. So you see swine as, as Gentiles as swine. Thanks, buddy. I know I've been porking out a little bit here lately, right? But I've been, been filling up a little bit. That's all right, you know. Pork chops are good. So is ham. So is bacon. You know, as long as I can feed a few feed, <laughs> as long as I can feed a few folks, you know, I'm good. You know, right? Right? I want to be that tree planted by the water that when it gets old, they cut it down and somebody heats their home. <laughs> right? My last dying breath, I'll bring somebody comfort. Good picture. I like it. Yeah. Is that how it picks up? What's a swine represent in Scripture? You, you remember, you can't make up typology, right? Right, Natika? Yeah. Right? You didn't do bad, girl. I'm telling you, you did not do bad. You did not do bad. I just, I just, who, who did you say the donkey was? Do you remember, right? You said the donkey was the Holy Spirit. Right. Right? <laughs> I can't wait till you meet the Holy Spirit and say, I'm sorry, I called you a donkey. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> 
right? Remember, she was doing the, 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 the withered hand man, the prophet, and he died on the road, and there's a lion on one side and a donkey on the other standing there, and the, the, the boy's going to collect the body of the dead prophet. And what's the picture of the dead prophet with the lion and the donkey? And she says, it's the Trinity, maybe. And it was a good guess. It was. There's three. So uh, uh, <laughs> I said, well, which one's God the Father? She goes, well, the lion. Which one's God the Son? The dead prophet. So where's the donkey? <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit. I said, okay. <laughs> Is the, is the donkey a Holy Spirit? It it's, could fit because there's places where he, the donkey's a beast of burden. And uh, But we want to, you know, the donkey carried Mary and the donkey did many other things. Jesus rode in on a donkey. You got to put all the donkeys together and figure out what the donkey represents in Scripture. But I, I don't think it's the Holy Spirit, but I think you'd be in trouble there. But your right idea. You got the right guess. Is is the swine represent Gentiles? Does does the mountain represent uh, Mount Sinai? Does it mean a uh, mountain in the Old Testament? Or, or does the mountain oftentimes represents a kingdom? Mountains are kingdoms in the, in the scripture. Well, to get the picture of what this is, what is the lake that demon possessed run into that, that destroys them? Is this the lake of fire? Right, Brittany's going, yeah. Yeah, I see the lake of fire. And uh, um, many see the lake of fire here, but many, many scholars see the lake of fire. Get the typology, you'll start to get some of the story, why this is in our scripture. You say, well, this takes thought. Yes, it does. Your Bible takes thought. Do not shut your brain off to read your Bible. God never intended that. Our modern day movement is turn on your emotions <gasps> and then shut off your brain. And, and, and this is why our kids are getting beat up so bad when they get to college and they get some philosophy teacher that can wipe them right off the map because they, 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 they just want to feel Jesus, come experience worship with us. Uh, no, 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 let's, let's, let's get our minds going. Uh, the Bible says be renewed by the, by the by transforming of your mind. Let your mind be transformed by Christ. And this is how your mind gets transformed, by the way. Reading the story doesn't transform your mind. Meditating on it. Thinking on it, thinking deep on it, trying to grasp it, trying to get it, trying to know what it is, pray over it, beg God to know what in the world is happening here. Your mind will be transformed. Well, how do I know what college to go to? How do I know where God will send me? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How? Beg God for knowledge of the scripture, and he will transform your mind, and your decisions will start being godly. That's how it works. This is what God does in our minds. So, um... Devils went out. They went into a man. I want to know why they went into swine. Why they wanted to go into swine? Why not just leave? Couldn't they go somewhere else beside the deep? Why was the choice between swine or the deep? You know, Lord, just just send us over there, right? Why not? And then why does the swine commit suicide? Do all animals commit suicide when they're possessed? Now we got three realms present. You've got the angelic realm. You've got the human realm. You've got the animal realm. Three realms God created. All three have a type of free will, but the animal's free will is not the same as man or angel. Angel and man both have the ability to resist God. Animals do not. Animals are always the innocent victim. Always the innocent victim. They did not sin like Adam, yet they die. Why do animals die? They never sinned. Why do animals have to, have to be tortured? Why do animals have to replace us? Why do animals have to come in and die on our behalf? Why do millions and billions and billions of animals have to die? They never sin. Why do they suffer so much? Because of man's sin. They're two different realms. Every animal in Scripture always obeyed God. Always. And they always will. By instinct, they obey God. They do not have the free will to disobey God. Man does. Angels do. Angels and man both disobeyed God. The third realm of the innocent. All three realms are represented right here. You've got some swine. You've got some angels. You've got a man. Hmm. The only one to end up dead is the animals. There's something here, friends. There's something here. Let's dig deeper. We'll have a good time. Did I cover most of the major points? Then cover them all. Oh, don't forget the prodigal son coming home. <laughs> don't for Remember we mentioned that in here? Uh, the devil goes out and says, I'll go back to where I left. Don't don't you got to tie these together. This is also in Luke. God puts them together. Um, let's see. Did I mention everything else? Uh, something worse can come upon you. What is worse than demon possession? <laughs> seven demon possession. What's seven? Um, what swept and garnished mean? Do we got that? 
Um, degrees of wickedness among devils, seven more wicked than himself. The last worse than the first. How can that happen? Right in there, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, I praise you not. You come together. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 10. You come together. When you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. He's talking about the church. It can come together and be worse off when they leave. The, my state can be worse. Yes. How is that possible? Uh, things that we do know about this list, okay? All we're doing is making lists. That's all we're doing here. Um, just Let me just read the list of things we do know for sure. Demons, Demon possession is real, according to this passage. Multi-demon possession is possible. Um, repossession is possible. Uh, many physical manifestations can be possible with demon possession. Many psychological effects of possession. We know that there's a type of worship that takes place or falling down before Christ by the possessed. We know there's the def defiance of the devils of the possession against Christ. It very, his very words, the defiant against it and the ability to rebel and God allows them to say no to him and refuse his obedience. That's... that's why does God allow sin to happen? How long is he going to put up with this? Why does God let kids die? Why does God let accidents die? Why does God let my friends die? Why does God let sin happen? Why doesn't God step in and stop it? Why does he? Why do you make Satan anyway? Where'd, where'd, where'd evil come from? If God's the source of all things, then where'd evil come from? What's the source of evil? One word, well. Two words. Somebody tell me. Compound word. Free will is the source of evil. God created free will. He did not create evil. Free will is the source of evil. God created free will. Did he know that free will be used for evil? Yes. But what's the greater good? Omniscient God can only make one choice. And that's the best choice that's possible. What's the best choice possible? That free will exists. That's the best choice, child. So how? Okay, I won't go too far. I won't give any answers away. You got that third realm of angels. How is it they defied Christ? The ability to effectively communicate through possession. They could. They can communicate. Notice Jesus says effective communication. Question, answer, question, answer, desire. But effective communication between in the spirit realm of the possessed. Notice this. It's, it's very much we learn here. The intelligence of devils. The, they, they are intelligent. They know the future. They know the plan. They know the power. They know what swine are. They know what a person is. They, they know, they understand. We see intelligence of the devils. The ability to effectively communicate. We've got that. The ability of devils to use, um, to use a possessed man's ears. Were the devils hearing God's voice through their own? Do devils have ears? Or were the spirits using the man's ears like they were using his voice? Were they using the man's eyes? What do angels see? Can they see without using us? What, what possession? So basically now we're talking about agency, and how does the devil use agency? Is he using the man's ears? He was using the man's throat. Or could the devil speak without the man talking? And if he did, would God hear him only? That were the disciples able to hear this conversation or to take place in the spirit realm is basically what we're asking. It appears as though that these devils are, are able to use the physical the places of a man. You know, that's what you do, right? You, the real you, that person that's living in this body. Your ears don't hear anything, right? They vibrate and they produce electrical impulses. Those electrical impulses go to your brain. Your brain doesn't hear anything. Your brain takes those electrical impulses and translates them. But it's the mind that takes the translation and gives it meaning. Take away the mind, and everything here could be healthy. There's no translation of the information. It's the mind-brain problem. That's how you know you have a soul, because the mind interprets both what you see and what you hear and what you feel and what you smell. Your mind interprets your senses and gives it meaning. Take away the mind, take away the senses. God proved it when he healed the man of blindness. He healed his eyes, and he still couldn't see. He said, Lord, I see men as trees walking. His brain couldn't interpret what his eyes were seeing. He reached again and fixed the man's brain. Why, why, did, why did he heal that man in two steps? He's teaching us something. What? He, Physical healing will never be enough. You need to be healed spiritually and soulically 
would be the term there, God to heal the mind. So understand, it's your brain that gives interpretation to things, right? That's why somebody steps on your foot and spills your coffee and you're turning your angry until you see it's a blind person. And the anger's gone. Why? How could I change emotion so fast and so instantly and so responsive because the mind took control. The mind was in control and the manner in which I interpret it determines my reaction. So don't say you're guided by your senses. You're guided by your interpretation. Good counseling for today. Yes, Pastor, I love you too. Uh, the ability of devils to use the possessed man's ears. Boy, that's important. The fear of the devils. They do live in fear. They are afraid of something. They're afraid of a coming time. <laughs> that's, 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 that's cool. That's cool. How many of you are looking forward to heaven? Right, right. We're talking on Wednesday nights about the one world government, the development of it, how it's going to develop. And we're like, what if it developed tomorrow? And all of a sudden, governments of the world collapsed economically. And, and all of a sudden, you see a rising up of a group of people saying, the one world government's here. And they start to develop and put into place the one world government. How many of you would be like, woohoo! Well, yes! It's here! Just like Pastor said, he wasn't crazy. And uh, all that happened. Are we excited about that, right? Because we know what God said is coming. We look forward to that. What are they doing? They, they're not looking forward to the end times. What if the one world government comes? What are the devils thinking? Uh-oh. What's the Bible say about the, the, the Antichrist or the Satan when he gets thrown out of earth? He says, he knows his time is short. Now, what happens when we know the time is short? <laughs> right? What if the doctor came to me and said, Dan, you're only going to live about another 24 hours. <laughs> we will see Jesus just like they saw him. There is no greater promise than this. Oh, are you kidding me? I mean, tomorrow at this time, I'm going to see Jesus. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sad, neither is my wife. She's rich. And uh, <laughs> I told her she can't have a party till after the funeral. Right, they got to wait for the funeral. Okay, the the relative uh, weakness of uh, I'm sorry, the relative wickedness of one devil to another. We learned that that there's a sequence. Uh, we also learned the future of devils is torment in the abyss, and that their great fear of that. Uh, they beg Christ to allow them to go into swine. We don't understand yet why that is that way. Um, we also learned that children can be possessed. So. Uh, um, uh, the only New Testament cross-reference I would like to give uh, is this one here. And I forgot about giving this one earlier, but let me just give you one New Testament cross-reference to help your Bible study. I hope you go home and think and study, and uh, you want to do it soon. Um, uh, 1 Timothy is not here. Um, it's here, but it's not in there. It's 2 Timothy 2.24. Uh, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If preadventure, God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. This is a great, uh, the pastor must, uh, how, how to counsel people is what he's talking about here. Uh, but in verse 26, he's talking about those that you must approach uh, and counsel. It says, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. What a tremendous statement. Who are taken captive by him at his will. So now we're talking about a captivation of the devil, taking people captive. You've got to determine who his will is. Is it Satan's will? Does he take people captive at his own will? Does he take these children captive at his will? And how do you get somebody to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil? And Jesus says, O oh, faithless generation. Why? Because they came to him to cure what could be cured. All right, let's go to the Lord. Father in heaven, help us understand the book. May somebody stand in awe of it. May all of us stand in awe of it. To know that I don't understand it. But to know I've grown in my understanding. That's, that's, that's what I want every day, Lord. Every day until I, until I see a face to face and then I stand in awe of how much I missed. Thank you, Lord, for the book. Thank you that it's so complicated. It's, it's fitting a God. A God of, of wonder. A God of amazement. A God can, who can use this book to save a tiny child, but you can use this book to, to stun scholars. Thank you, Lord, for just, you're amazing. And uh, because of this book, Lord, I, I'm going to heaven. Because of this book, Lord, I, I believe. Because of this book, I, I know, I know you are God. And I know that you care and love for mankind. And that <laughs> part of that's me.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Take us with thy blessing. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for the church. May this place be blessed, Lord. I pray that you increase us to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.